Evet, efendim. Welcome back to the seventh panel of our conference. This is the uh, the seventh panel, and we will be finishing with the eighth panel soon. And I can already see how tired you are. During this panel, uh, we will be talking about a subject which is not widely covered. Only a few books uh, touch upon these issues. This is also a consequence of the Russian Civil War. As the Red Army wins the war, then uh, the, their adversaries would flee and come to Istanbul, among other places. But this starts to change social life in Istanbul. For instance, uh, Istanbul people learn uh, learned how to use uh, beaches or how to hang out at certain cafes and bars thanks to white Russians or Belarusians. They also opened up some uh, cafes and restaurants and later some of them actually uh, left for Europe. We have two presentations. The first uh, panelist is uh, Timur Saito. History and Political Sciences at Tel Aviv University in 2012. He received his master's degree in Middle Eastern and Ottoman History, State University of New York at Binghamton. He is currently a PhD candidate and teaching assistant at the Department of History, Binghamton University. His research interests include forced migration and refugee studies, modern Middle East, Ottoman and Russian imperial societies, global history, humanitarianism, and identity transformation. Uh, Timur Bey, you have 20 minutes, and try to be precise with time, please. Thank you. You may start. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, can you see my PowerPoint slides? Yes, we do. Okay. Well, bring it to a slideshow, please. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you for this opportunity to present my work. Russian civil war refugees in occupied Istanbul. The ongoing Russian-Ukrainian war of 2022 forced many people to flee from their homes and Ukraine and Russia, creating a catastrophic refugee situation that resembles another one that happened around 100 years ago. Then the Russian Civil War drove away millions of people of different ethnic, cultural and social backgrounds from the collapsing Russian Empire. Approximately 200,000 of them arrived in Istanbul. Could you Today, slow down a bit, please? Uh, translators are having a difficult time. Okay. Today, Istanbul is one of the most important safe heavens for refugees fleeing ongoing war. Despite the difference in 100 years, many refugee concerns are similar. Uncertainty in the future, legal status, finite information resources, economic survival, and many others. 100 years ago, refugees from, from the former Russian Empire tried to survive and maintain their status as independent individuals in their new environment in occupied Istanbul. They discovered many ways to do this. This presentation is extensively based on primary accounts of Russian refugees. While many facts and observations mentioned in these accounts are may be historically correct, first and foremost, they present the voices of people who perceive and process their surrounding dynamics and environment through the prism of their tragedy, background, and circumstances. Even these voices are not represented equally. In this presentation, we hear people who have the energy, resources, and abilities to deliver these voices to us. <clears throat> By the beginning of the 20th century, Istanbul was a capitalistic city. The arrival of the Allies intensified the atmosphere of pursuit of profit in the city. Nadezhda Tefi, the Russian immigrant satirist writer, 
noted that despite the political turmoil of the post-war period in the former Ottoman Empire, quotes, Constantinople was busy with finishing its trade deals, collecting commission charges, and playing on exchange stocks. All this must be done quickly because no one knew when or how this situa situation will end, end quotes. Western companies in the city opened uh, uh, organized profitable trade, exporting and importing many goods. The black, ma black market also was flourishing in the general social economic difference between those who profited from the war and those who suffered from poverty increased during the armistice period. The capitalistic environment in Istanbul resonated with the experiences of servant entrepreneur minded Russian exiles in the city and created a peculiar business excitement among the Russians. Multiple businesses were opened and closed. Every new, every new refugee arriving in Istanbul with money became a source of financial excitement. Uh, excuse yeah. me, excuse me. Uh, please do not use the earphones. Unplug them, take them out, because it's creating a technical problem. Oh, I'm not using the earphones. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um... Russian money had minimal value, though. A refugee who possessed Turkish lira's was considered a rich man. A refugee who had European or Europe, uh, American money usually uh, was treated as the master of this strange world as its fleeing guests. The commercial initiative of the refugees should be understood in a broader sense. It included factories, shops, service companies, and retail, as well as original ways to find subsistence in the city. <clears throat> Refugee, uh, Russian entrepreneurs exploited every possible resource. They communicated with local citizens and, and the allies to obtain funding and use cheap labor force from the socially and economically divided Russian community uh, of refugees. The ways of surviving in the city dependent in a big measure on the social status of a refugee. The Russian Refugee Society was not a homogeneous group and consisted of different social economic categories. Besides nobility and bourgeoisie, many civilian refugees were, uh, were, uh, were peasants, townspeople who escaped the violent chaos of the civil war. The refugee soldiers and even many of the high command officers at this point were too represented by lower classes such as servicemen and peasants. The most pragmatic people of the richest category of Russian refugees visited Istanbul only to pay tolls, fees, and bribes, and to arrange the required documents for the continuation of their journey to Europe or America. Another very important category of rich refugees stayed in Istanbul because their hope to return to the motherland, uh, and they hoped to, uh, to be close to the Russian borders at that day. They waited until the moment when it became clear that their return was impossible. Meanwhile, they supported themselves by selling many of their treasures bought from Russia to city pawn shops, usually owned by the Greeks and Korean Russians. Many of their belongings eventually reached private collections all, all over the world. On the other hand, some of the wealthy Russian refugees had enough money to leave the city and did not have any illusions about returning, but yet stayed in Istanbul. Those few people wanted to utilize the commercial opportunities created by the consumption demands of the Russian refugee community in, in the occupied city. The alcohol enterprises of Kramskoy, Romanenko, and Smirnov, the only businesses that in the city that we can call factories, can be an example of this approach. Their facilities were located on Tarlabashi Street, surrounded by other Russian places. After most of the refugees left the city and these commercial opportunities had gone, one of the entrepreneurs, Smirnov, even found a way to return to Soviet Russia. Along with this category of wealth, wealthy Russians, many had neither money nor social connections and experience to overcome all the bureaucratic obstacles and threats of the Allied administration in the city. However, they were quite resourceful and diligent to start finding any opportunities to organize their businesses in Istanbul. For a resourceful Russian entrepreneur in Istanbul, the main concern was to find, quote-unquote, a capitalist, someone who would be willing to provide the starting capital 
for her and for his business in the city. This resourceful Russians knew every existing address among western organizations and philanthropists where they could apply for the financial support. Most likely, however, however this would be a prosperous week in Terra Ogalata. Some money lenders offered short-term loans at, at more than 100% interest for six months. With the usual for the elite class Russians uh, essentialist attitude, the both Belozovsky remembered, quote, all the Greeks are greedy and keep their leaders. We managed to, quote unquote, sell one of them and he gave money for our cabaret masks, end quote. The sponsor of Alexander Borutinsky restaurant, Rose Noir, was his Turkish acquaintance in Red Dune Bay. Russian refugee entrepreneurs in the city quite early opened their first stores in Istanbul. There is butcher, uh, butcher and sausage shops, bakeries, and commission shops. Besides renowned restaurants, Russian restaurants, Terra district was full of houseware stores, interiors, and workshops. Among the enterprises were also private detective bureau, an overseas travel company, a resort on Floria Beach, and many others. Finally, most Russian refugees were stuck in Istanbul due to a lack of money, de dejected spirit, in inadaptability to work, and total lack of uh, employment experience. Among them were students, cadets, young officers, clerks, nobles, aristocrats, and many others. These people, many of whom experienced a considerable de decline in status, constituted a labor force. Many worked for Russian enterprises such as uh, restaurants, but also took every available job in the city. There were shepherds, janitors, gardeners, servants, loaded floor, coal, firewood, crushed stones, paved roads, uh, and many others. Often they were, uh, they were forced to work 14 to 16 hours a day for more than 10 to 15 liters per month. There were a Russian red fair in Eminem Square, where Russian, uh, Russians, uh, Russian refugees traded goods in hopes uh, of gaining a little bit more money than they uh, would get from the commission shops. At the Galata stairs, refugees traded a variety of Russian currencies until the Ottoman government completely prohibited the import and circulation of any Russian banknotes and valuable papers in March 1919. Uh, Russian, uh, later, Russian traders uh, Russians traded Soviet rubles, which local authorities considered to be illegal propaganda literature. The Russian embassy and consulate yards served as another attractive point for a Russian rug fair. On the Galata Bridge, PT peddlers traded matches, pencils, envelopes, candies, bagels, and donuts. Since they looked tattered, passersby considered them beggars rather than traders. The income of those refugees was about 20 to 30 piastres a day, and that was hardly sufficient not to starve to death. Simonovich writes in his diaries that Russian men were engaged in fishing uh, from the bridge. Um, <clears throat> uh, Russian refugees had to deal with the order of enforcement in the city. The Allies tried to eliminate vagrancy and begging from the streets. Thus, when the Russian refugees tried to make their living by performing on the streets, the police could accuse them of illegal begging. As well as was the case of uh, blind man Alexei Sirolyatkin who played harmonium on Terra Street. Often the Allied patrols used their police batons against Russian refugees, su suspecting them of communist gathering, trying to suppress hunger rights or just for their own entertainment. Many Russian businesses were opened without proper registration because they tried to evade paying regular taxes and fees imposed by the Ottoman government to collect some income from its population. When Allied or Ottoman policemen came to, uh, to close these illegal activities, Russian entrepreneurs paid bribes. If police visits became too frequent, Russians went bankrupt and closed their enterprises anyway. In the atmosphere of tough competition, many refugees engaged in fraud, scam, and other dubious activities. Some made the profit by selling humanitarian aid, others organized fake joint stock companies, local newspapers blamed Russians for their dentist practicing without proper licenses, counterfeiting Turkish money, 
importing cocaine inside Russians' high heels and maintaining illegal brothels. Some residents went even further and argued that it is Russians who brought these immoral vices to the city. Scapegoating of refugees, unfortunately, is a common phenomenon in the host countries. Counterfeiting drugs and prostitution existed in such a big city as Istanbul long before Russians arrived. Water and cockroach races often appear in memoirs and scholarship regarding Russian enterprises in Istanbul. The Ottoman organization of assistance to disabled veterans, which possessed a mon monopoly on conducting lotteries in Istanbul, managed to prohibit illegally organized Russian lotteries after a massive and well-organized campaign. When it came to lawsuits, whatever the reason, Russians were subject to formal allied protection due to the capitulation regime and could not be tried in Ottoman courts. This outraged the Ottoman law enforcement institutions because in many cases they were not able to persecute crime where Russian subjects were involved. Even in cases of murder, the Allied police could forcibly release convicts based on their Russian subjecthood. More than that, until a certain period, the Russians had their own court and prison. Uh, Timur and Bey, you have three minutes. Okay, thank you. So, uh, however, this prison and this court was closed in 1921. Earning money through different types of entertainment was very popular among Russian refugees. Since the most Russian refugees did not speak Turkish, their entertainment enterprises were often based on visual amusements such as pantomime, decorations, signboards with images, and visual commercials. Singing and playing music by Russian refugees was a usual phenomenon in Istanbul. Symphonic orchestras uh, played the dance and jazz music at hotels, uh, accompanied silent movies, uh, and just on streets. Despite the variety commercial base, the restaurant business became a model and the dominant form of Russian enterprises. On the one hand, hand Russian restaurants were very competitive among other public eateries owing to their unique style and offer, that offered traditional Russian cuisine, hilarious entertainment, and female server services. On the other hand, they essentially were employment centers for many refugees. Many could be accepted as servers, dormant, local attendants, general la laborers. Many tried to be hired at performance on the stage, painters prepared menus, decorations and posters, and poets wrote commercials. The place of Russian refugee women uh, should be considered on the situation of emancipated women in Istanbul at that period. When Russians arrived, this facilitated more debates and excitement. Um, although in many cases it was humiliating experience, Russian refugee women were able to utilize these excitements and debates as a tool for their survival. Usually many women worked at servers and child care uh, caretakers but uh, they had a big chance to be hired by restaurants because uh, female servers attracted a lot of clients and also the performance on the stage attracted many clients, singing, dancing, and uh, other performances involved women on the stage. Caricatures in the Ottoman newspapers reflected this, uh, uh, the addiction of Turkish men to Russian women's beauty. Uh, and this capture says, 897 million. Oh, not bad. It's all our, it's entire our salary. The price should probably include other things though. Turkish collective memory and historiography remember those Russian women as Harashalar, nostalgic remembrance of something good with elements of erotization and paternalistic fondness. Um, okay, conclusion. Russian refugee community in Istanbul consisted of different social groups, each of which found a variety of ways to earn money and survive in the city. Russian refugees proved to be able to read the social cultural map of the city and utilize it for their own benefit. Such social phenomena as uh, women's emancipation, modern fashion and clothes, behavior, music, as well as commercialization of entertainment define the directions and shapes of refugees and enterprises. Ottoman and later Republican authorities played a significant role in the legal regulations of Russian businesses. 
the Ottoman authorities prohibited lotteries, the new Turkish Republican government, while attempting to consolidate uh, to consolidate between consolidate between Muslim traditions and secular uh, Western culture, introduced new taxes on alcohol and on dancing in public. Gradually, many Russian restaurants, gaming houses, lotter clubs, stores, and other enterprises were closed under the pressure of the new rules. New laws also prohibited foreigners, including Russians, to be engaged in a wide list of occupations usually essential for the uh, Russian refugees. All this eventually changed the legal environment in the city, restricting Russian activity and ending the Russian entertainment industry in Istanbul. Some famous restaurant, Russian restaurants were transferred to new Turkish owners. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our second uh, speaker is Anushova Nisyan. Uh, she's from Yerevan. She holds a master's degree in Turkology at Leningrad St. Petersburg State University and a PhD from the Institute of Oriental Studies at the same university. She is currently a researcher at the Department of Turkish Studies at the Institute of Oriental Studies of National Academy of Sciences of Armenia. Her research interests include the history of Ottoman Empire, regional policy of Turkey, and the problems of Armenian genocide. You have 20 minutes. Thank you, Ayman. Um, uh, Hello, well, once again, first of all, I would like to thank the Hurantin Foundation for giving me this opportunity, the organization committee, everyone present here and all the attendees for this wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Just like always, here we are um, dealing with some very important issues. And I'd like to once again thank the foundation for their invitation. And with your permission, now I am going to switch to English. I uh, will also speak about the white Russians, so-called white Russians, but, uh, but um, in difference of the previous reporter, um, I will uh, speak about the uh, military component of this emigration. Uh, maybe the first topic is actual also now, because we see a lot of Russians here. Uh, but uh, there is no military presence. So my report will be about the military presence. So um, uh, fate decreed that at the end of civil war, the largest number of immigrants from Russia ended up on Turkish shores. About 260,000 military and civilian people who did not share the ideas of the revolution ended up in Istanbul, which became a transient point for one part of the Russian emigration and a permanent home for another. Tens of thousands of Russians ended up in a country of a different culture, language, and religion. Moreover, in a country that just recently suffered a crushing defeat in the World War. There was a Greek-Turkish war, and the liberation movement was gaining strength, as a result of which a new secular state replaced the almost six-century feudal theocratic monarchy. Only in the context of this kind of historical facts can one try to more or less reliably recreate the dramatic history of the post-revolutionary Russian refugee in Turkey. Imagine Istanbul at that time, about 10,000 British and 8,000 French soldiers, 8,000 Indians as part of the Entente occupation forces, 2,000 Italians, even the Japanese. And then there is the almost 300,000 strong avalanche of Russian refugees. The command of the occupation troops of the Entente countries that won the First World War felt like absolute masters in Eastern Trace. But the very fact of the militarized 
presence of the paramilitary contingent of the Russian white emigration nullified the entire regime of the British-French occupation. This objectively weakened the ability of the occupying authorities to organize support for the Istanbul government in its internal political confrontation with the Ankara government of the Kemalists. So, um, uh, this um, exodus of white Russians, uh, once forgotten, now is very actual in Russia and it is a subject for many novels, very beautiful films, movies, and uh, um, works, other works of art. Here I, I would like to present some of them. This is uh, the, the whole topic is, let us say, the last ship for Constantinople, this panic exodus of Russians. So, um, and this is uh, the picture of Elias in Bosphorus. So, but um, difficulties became more and more. First of all, they were connected with the unwillingness uh, of former allies in the Entente to have a well-trained, disciplined Russian army on the territory under their control. The French command stated that General Wrangel um, is very possible in, in every, every possible way with the um, formed a kind of government in Constantinople and claims to keep the troops taken out of the Crimea in the position of the army. At the same time, the noble French leadership reproached Wrangel in every possible uh, way with the expenses of over 200 million francs, while the bill received from the Russian army was allegedly estimated at only um, 30 million francs. In fact, yesterday's allies left the Russians face to face with the problem of physical survival. Um, um, the attitude could have been even uh, more worse uh, and together if it were not the general Wrangel at the time of unloading on the Turkish coast some small arms which objectively did not allow the French occupation authorities to deport them to Soviet Russia without armed and therefore bloody resistance for both sides of the Russian resistance. Yes, and the very existence of the National Liberation Movement of Mustafa Kemal Pasha kept the French occupation authorities from open armed actions against the officers and soldiers of the former White Russian Army, since it seriously feared the possibility of them going over to the side of the Kemalists. Um, and um, from the moment the Russian white military emigrants arrived in Turkey, the Cold War between the Russian army and especially French occupation corps started. General Wrangel from the first days became extremely negative about the troops of the occupation corps and according to the recollections of the officers who surrounded him, he only dreamed of how he would crack down on the allies. Um, so, um, uh, thus in uh, 1921, the change in the attitude of the Russian white guards evacuated from the Crimea to Turkey started and its people was officially demonstrated. In less than a year, they managed to go from being perceived as an enemy in the very recent First World War to trust and cordially in their relations as representatives of great nation who shared with them the hardships of exile from their homeland. By summer of 1921, the desire of French government to disperse the Gallipoli troops was finally revealed and thereby, as uh, it then seemed to the French, to destroy not only the cutters of the Crimean army, but also the idea of the white arm struggle. 
Commander of the 1st Infantry Division of the Russian Army in Gallipoli, Lieutenant General Witkovsky, in the Article Field Campaign, wrote, quotation, as we can see, the command of the Russian white military emigrants seriously uh, not only considered, but also actively prepared to implement plans for achieve hostilities against part of the French occupation corps, both in the vicinity of Istanbul and throughout the European part of Turkey, which, if implemented, could lead to the entry of absolutely all Russian white guards into the Turkish national liberation movement. And it was a very, very serious plot. Uh, and the army of uh, Wrangel um, was training, uh, artillery training, gymnastic training to be informed, to be to keep them informed. So, at the same time, uh, Moscow Bolsheviks and Kemalists they were in contact, and Moscow asked Kemalists to spy to make some intelligence activities among these white Russians. And Moscow continued its intelligence activities. Um, but uh, I, I want to, to show you one of uh, the telegrams of um, the Russian ambassador Aralev, ambassador here in, East, in uh, Turkey, in, in, in Ankara. And uh, he is in, uh, in that monument, in that statue in Taksim Square near, next to Ataturk. He wrote, the Turkish population is silent, but in this silence one can feel the gnashing of teeth. And sometime later, in December 1922, uh, another representative of Bolshevik Russia uh, uh, wrote, uh, to Russian consul in Istanbul, Mr. Golub, um, that uh, they seem uh, two main reasons to uh, uh, make, uh, which made difficulties for them. First, the Sultan continued to sit on the throne and uh, he is also the caliph, a symbol of familiar life, and soldiers of uh, the three uh, of 30,000 strong coalition army of the European powers were serially working around Istanbul. Their powerful navy with cannons aimed at the city was standing in the waters of Bosphorus, and from time to time a craft of the invaders flew in the sky. So, um, anyway, Great Britain tried to get Ankara to recognize the main provisions of the Treaty of Sever. Ankara categorically refused and in turn demanded the immediate withdrawal of foreign troops from Anatolia. The retreat of the Greek army dramatically changed the situation and accordingly the poisonous of um, uh, the positions of the Entente powers. France immediately signed a separate treaty with Ankara uh, government and left the occupied territory. Even early Italy withdrew its troops from Anatolia. As for Greeks, they did not want to leave Turkey and England continued to secretly help them. So the recognition of Turkey as a sovereign state obliged the Entente countries to leave Istanbul and the forts of the Straits. On uh, October 2, 1923, the occupying forces had to withdraw from Istanbul and on October 6, the Anatolian army entered Istanbul. Here is the trainings. So, uh, the Turks and Soviet Russia will be disturbed by the presence on the territory of Turkey of a large foreign army, which has retained the discipline and features of a regular army. Turkey in solving the problem of Russian refugees had to constantly maneuver between Soviet government and League of Nations. And uh, in the autumn, for example, of 1922, the Grand National Assembly passes a resolution limiting the stay of Russian refugees on the country to five years. 
That is, until 1927, they must make a vital choice, either to leave the country or take Turkish citizenship. Before leaving for Turkey, Potemkin, a representative of Russia, met with the ambassador of the Ankara government in Moscow, who assured him that the commission, special commission, would be assisted in solving its task in Istanbul. And the task were as followers. First, to help those who emigrated to Turkey together with the Wrangel army and Russian prisoners, ob obviously of the First World War, who wish to return to their homeland, leave Istanbul. According to Potemkin's information, which he received back in Moscow, there were about 10,000 of them in Istanbul. Second, to transfer the real estate of the Russian Empire located in Turkey, embassy building, etc., into the ownership of the Soviet state, and uh, on September 29, Potemkin made a statement to the Turkish press about the purpose of the Soviet Commission visit. In particular, he said, there will not be and cannot be any coercive actions in relation to Russian immigrants on our part, and we will remain here until we fulfill our mission. But we know that many who returned they were exiled or executed. The Russians were now and then summoned to the police on questions, for example, about the plans of the British, which could not possibly be known to them. At the same time, the central Istanbul newspapers, Aksham, Jumhuriyet, Milliyet, began to publish articles accusing the refugees of having a bad influence on local customs, of being hostile to Turkey, to its government, to the new republican reforms, of um, uh, ingratitude for their hospitality, and they also published ridiculous novels with sequels <coughs> in which refugees start the restoration of the monarchy in Turkey. Newspapers consider it necessary to expedite the expulsion of white Russians from the country. I am finishing. Mm -hmm. Uh, in November 1927, uh, at a reception at the Soviet Embassy on the occasion of the decade of Soviet power, Tefik Rushtu was again underlined by Moscow's desire to see Istanbul without white Russians. <coughs> in uh, the army, in the refugees, change of moral guidelines uh, of the Russian military emigration occurred, from sympathy for the allies in the Entente to support of Mustafa Kemal Pasha, and it is very interesting evolution. Um, so we understand that the young republic had to solve many difficult problems, including the problem of white Russians also. Reproachment between Ankara and Moscow will have a direct impact on the problem of Ru Russian refugees in Turkey. And the faced evacuation of the remnants of Russian white formations from military camps in Turkey to the Slavic Balkan countries began in August 1921 and dragged on until 1923 and somehow later. By 1924, the Russian emigration of Istanbul, having experienced a short period of prosperity, began to gradually disperse, taking away in their souls a sense of gratitude to all those who extended a helping hand to Russian emigrants who found themselves on the shores of the Bosphorus. In 1924, the Russian emigration is in Istanbul, having experienced uh, the period of prosperity, they uh, published a book which, uh, with the name Farewell Istanbul. The Almanach, consisting of three parts in Russian, French and English, was an attempt to express a sense of gratitude to all those who extended a helping hand to Russian emigrants who found themselves on the shores of the Bosphorus. It is not enough to say, I am quoting, that Turkey was hospitable. 
it fraternally warmed those who lost their fatherland. How many life-giving forces Turkey gave us with its meek and heroic people who for the first time called us brothers, us Russians. The world Kardash will remain in our memory forever. Except Turkey, fraternal thanks and fraternal far away from us. And me too, I want to thank you, Istanbul, for listening to me. Uh, thank you, Hanush. Now it is time to receive your questions about our uh, panelists. We're talking about more than a quarter of a million uh, Russian soldiers and civilians coming to Istanbul, and that uh, is something that is worthy of um, further study. Aisha, please. And um, I actually saw something in the slides, which is what prompted my question, so it may be too detailed, but um, when these waves of, you know, uh, migrations began, I believe, mostly in 1919 and 1920, I didn't know the numbers, actually, I learned from you, it's 260,000, uh, apparently. Um, and some also went to Tunisia, Bizerte, but Istanbul received the highest number of uh, Russians fleeing the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, I also read this, uh, at some point that um, some of them, I mean, Istanbul was like a hub for most of them, in fact, they moved away from Istanbul eventually. Red Cross played a part in that. Figures like Thomas Whittemore, you know, the founder of the Byzantine Institute uh, in the U.S., in fact, he was involved in, uh, you know, the, these, uh, I guess, moves away from Istanbul, helps with replacing uh, Russians. And I read, and which surprised me, that there was this effort to move them to Brazil. Um, and I wonder why was that? Uh, uh, I mean, there was an effort, and there are, in fact, there's a small Russian uh, population in Brazil, apparently, because they moved from Istanbul to there. Um, and it, apparently, it was a conscious effort, uh, although it failed. Uh, I, I mean, it didn't really succeed as much as, you know, uh, how the planners, I mean, basically the Red Cross, I believe, may be a part of it. So I wonder why that was the case, why they moved from Istanbul to Brazil. Um, when we are speaking about uh, so-called white refugees, white uh, Russian uh, refugee wave, um, we have um, to make a uh, difference between uh, 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 civil population, refugees and militaries. For militaries, allies had a special plan, first of all. But as usual, um, immediately, after this, uh, um, immediately after the sever, yesterday we were discussing the London Conference of 1921, the contradictions between uh, allies started <clears throat> and uh, the usage of these uh, military emigrants, um, it became very problematic, you know. Uh, so, um, but they stay in, uh, it was a military pre presence in Istanbul, in Istanbul proper, in ha um, Adalar, um, because uh, it was a property of Russian Empire, some, they had some property over there. And um, in Gallipoli, in Gallipoli, and Cossacks were in Chatalja, in Chatalja. <laughs> so after this, and the Bolshevik Russian government, uh, which was in a contact with the Kemalists, they wanted to use them like their spies and so on, somehow use and um, to, to have some intelligence about the plans of French and especially Britons. But um, when they uh, um, when they saw that they cannot do this, they became to um, to force Kemalist government to find a way to get rid of these refugees, especially military part of it. 
Uh, second, uh, the second part of your question is about the civil population, Red Cross and so on. Okay, uh, they, they make some efforts and uh, some of these uh, Russian refugees were, for example, in, in Lemnos, in uh, these um, uh, islands. Uh, but, you know, the period was, uh, uh, you have uh, to waste money, waste forces and so on, so um, not always all the plan, they, they could, um, I mean, fulfill all their plans, Red Cross and other uh, humanitarian organizations. This is the one part of the answer, and the second is some of these refugees, they like Istanbul, for example, there are a lot of women who married, changed their families because uh, then during the Republic it was necessary. And uh, even, you know, when I, I was uh, uh, preparing my report, um, I found a lot of uh, women who, who are Russians or had the Russian um, roots, but with Turkish fam Soyad families. So, and they wrote, now there are a lot of literature in Turkish, of Turkish authors, Turkan Olcay, uh, Marina Semirci, and so on. And they are the heirs of that um, refugees who stayed here, who loved. And there are, you know, there are some also Kazakhs who, from this Chatalja, who changed their names, their families, and even became, uh, um, adopt Islam, but they have Kazakhs in their roots. It is also very interesting topic. Uh, Any other questions? No. Okay. <gülüyor> You're wrong. Uh, evet, başka soru var mı? Hmm? Please. Very technical question. It's my ignorance as well. But why do we call Beyaz Rus in Turkish Russian immigrants, refugees, white Russians? White Russians? Yeah. Please. Thank you. Red and white. Uh, because, uh, you know, the uh, Bolshevik army, they called themselves red. red. And in opposite of them, they called them white. Uh, these Bolsheviks called them white. Because first of all, they had um, white um, uh, uh, bands on their, yes, on their, um, heads and after it all the army. This is one of the version, versions because nobody exactly <laughs> doesn't know why, but this is one of the version. And if we have Ihan, have we a, t a little bit time? A little yes. Bit. Uh, listen, I found very interesting, um, very interesting um, piece uh, from the mem memoirs of one of the officers of Rangel's army uh, who wrote, I'm quoting, uh, he wrote, it can be argued without exaggeration that never again during emigration, even in hospitable Slavic countries, Russians did not feel like at home, wrote he as in 1921 and 1922 in Constantinople, Istanbul. You know why? And he exp explained, there were no owners in Constantinople at that time. Everyone was a guest, including the Turks themselves. The Allied command could be considered the hosts, 
but it was listed in this position only by the right of force and Caesar, and therefore morally also could not be recognized as a real, real owner. Among the Turks, the moral rights to the position of the owner were fiercely contested by the Greeks, and the Greeks were intensely, passionately rejected by the Turks, who hated them more than the Allies. Thus the Russians, having arrived from the Crimea, felt at home. And what a mass of people it was. This is very... Very interesting indeed. Uh, Seeing as there are no further questions, we would like to adjourn this session. I want to tell you, if there is no question, maybe to, to, to make the clarifications like a little bit about this data, that uh, French government was especially uh, eager to get rid of Russians. And one of the pragmatic reasons is to, it's to financial uh, limitations of all this uh, organization that supported Russian refugees. And French also wanted to, uh, to use any opportunity to uh, sent Russians anyway, uh, and they used uh, they recruited Russian so Russian soldiers into the French legion, legion, and sent them to Deserta. But that was a very big problem for Russians. It was a big issue because there they found uh, very bad treatment, and uh, he, uh, it's a big cruelty of Russian uh, French officers. And this this uh, ship returned eventually, and it was a, a very uh, loud issue among the Russian community there, so they, uh, they trust into the French enterprises like reduced significantly because of this. And regarding the white Russians, the uh, it's purely my speculation, but I would um, also, as a, in the case of uh, Russian women, uh, uh, they call them Harashalar, so that basically maybe there is some connotation of whiteness of these people and some sort of uh, uh, civilizational differences. It's pure speculation, of course, but uh, I think there was some connotations in the record how to uh, perceive these people coming from, from Russia. Thank you, Timur Saito. Uh, that, <coughs> there is one uh, question for you. Uh, please ask. Uh, asked the speaker Tibur Saitov if he can define what his sources define Russian. Rus nasıl bir şey acaba? it's it's very good question. It's, uh, thank you for asking this because usually when we speak about Russian refugees, why it be Azruslar in Istanbul? Uh, we think of Russians, but it's not. Uh, of course, ma apparently maybe majority was Russians. But uh, there was a lot of people of Ukraine, Ukrainian origins, uh, and from all all places in Russia, even not Slavic people. Uh, as yesterday was mentioned, there were Kalmyks there, there were there were Tatars and many others. So ethnically, uh, they were represented very. Uh, it was diverse uh, community, especially active were Ukrainian refugees there. They, uh, they didn't want to be associated with Russian refugees at that, uh, in Istanbul. They, uh, they uh, said that we need different refugee camps even for, for Ukrainians because we are not Russians. It was a huge issue even then, 100 years ago. They, di they didn't want to be part of Russia. The, uh, one of the uh, elements of the revolution and civil war was to, for the independence of parts of Russia, specifically Ukraine, Finland, and Poland, etc. So when these people come together, in Istanbul, they hated each other in many cases, and they didn't want to be under the uh, jurisdiction of Kwangil. They said, we have our own what the Ottomans. We want to be uh, totally independent uh, unity in Istanbul, and they asked to be separated from Russians uh, in, in, in many refugee camps. So yes, and besides the Ukrainians, there were Jews, Baltic people and many others. And ethnically, uh, because of this, many people, many Russian like many refugees coming from Russian Empire, uh, when they were dispersed, they dispersed to different directions, uh, depending on 
to what state they belong. There were new states like Poland and uh, the three Baltic states that uh, helped their own refugees, their ethnically, their nationalities, new nationalities. So they, uh, it was easy for them to take these people and not Russians or some others. And uh, is, uh, Israeli settlement in Palestine, they also came to uh, work hardly in Istanbul to find Jewish Russian uh, Jewish refugees from Russia to try to bring them to Palestine. So this was a very uh, important issue, very uh, diverse community. Thank you. Evet, teşekkürler diyelim ve Thank you very much. Let us invite Engin Bey, who is the chairperson of the next panel. Thank you so much for your attention. Just one more thing before we conclude this panel. Uh, over the course of these two days, we have some unsung heroes sitting at the back, our interpreters, and we'd like to thank them and give them a big round of applause. Thank you.